Attention all stations concerned, there will not be an update of the CBS Evening News. From CBS News headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Bob Schieffer substituting for vacationing Walter Cronkite. And in Washington, Eric Severide, Fred Graham, Neil Strausser, Robert Pierpoint in Columbus, Ohio, Sharon Lovejoy in Chicago, Bob McNamara in Forest Hills, New York, Bert Quint in Nicosia, and Bruce Dunning in Tokyo. Good evening. One of the big unresolved questions of the Vietnam War seems to be moving swiftly toward a possible resolution. What to do about the thousands of young men who fled the country in the military rather than serve in uniform? Today, the Pentagon said that several bases are being studied as processing centers for deserters and draft dodgers who may choose to come home under a policy of conditional amnesty that President Ford is favored. And tomorrow morning, the president is scheduled to receive specific recommendations about such a plan of leniency for the war resistors. The White House said the president is expected to act quickly on it. Meantime, Mr. Ford made a gesture of conciliation to the nation's students today in a graduation speech at Ohio State University. Robert Pierpoint reports. The president was formally welcomed by political leaders, but Ohio State is a football power whose longtime student hero is Coach Woody Hayes. So the coach got the most presidential attention. I met Woody at the airport. We just had our picture taken together. And when the picture appears in today's dispatch, I'm pretty sure what the caption will say. Woody Hayes and friend. President Ford said young people nowadays want a job that makes sense as well as money, and he proposes to help. I will do everything in my power to bring education and employers together in a new climate of credibility, an atmosphere in which universities turn out scholars and employers turn them on. Then the president went on to give another answer to inflation besides cutting the federal budget. Productivity, yours as well as mine, must improve if we are to have less of an inflationary economy. In the long run, it is the only way that we can raise wages without inflationary price increases. It is essential in creating new jobs and in increasing real wages. Afterward, the president received an honorary Doctor of Laws degree and two tickets to this year's Michigan-Ohio State football game. He asked for two more for Henry Kissinger. If Henry Kissinger can successfully negotiate <laughs> the long-standing disputes between uh, the Israelis and the Arab nations, he might have an opportunity to do it between Woody Hayes and Bo Schembechler. Recent presidents have had problems visiting college campuses because of Vietnam and Watergate, but today there were only a dozen or so demonstrators well outnumbered by police. Back at the airport, President Ford did a little politicking, first with local Republicans, with newsmen kept outside. Then with a crowd of well-wishers. Nice, nice Hi, girls. All dressed up here. Robert Pierpoint, CBS News, Columbus, Ohio. After the president returned to Washington, the White House announced that he expects to campaign this fall for both Republicans and Democrats who back his policy of fiscal restraint. The White House also sought to silence talk within the administration of a proposed 10 cent a gallon increase in gasoline taxes. The spokesman said Mr. Ford opposes such a boost as exorbitant, unwise, and unnecessary. A lawyer for Richard Nixon said today that the ex-president, in spite of hundreds of thousands of dollars in assets, is having money problems. The lawyer, Fred Ladorf, called it a cash flow problem. In other words, less money coming in than is going out. The lawyer said various possibilities are being explored to ease the situation, including the possibility of selling some property.
As the weather gets warmer, you open and close your refrigerator a lot more often. That's the time to put in a fresh box of Arm & Hammer baking soda. Baking soda absorbs odors caused by warm weather foods, leaves your refrigerator cleaner, fresher smelling. And it'll do the same for your cat's litter box. Just use one part baking soda with three parts cat litter. It actually absorbs odor for several days. Three parts cat litter to one part Arm & Hammer baking soda. It really works. I'll admit it, I've got a few pounds of extra weight. And it can be just like carrying around a ball and chain. Who needs it? So, I'm exercising and eating smart at every meal, starting with the Special K breakfast. It gives me protein plus vitamins and iron, all for less than 240 calories. That's right, a whole breakfast for less than 240 calories. And it's delicious. The Special K breakfast, it'll help me get rid of this darling little ankle bracelet. Greece officially notified the NATO countries today that it is withdrawing its troops from military participation in the Western Alliance, but Greece said it will retain a political part in NATO. The withdrawal was triggered by Turkey's invasion of Cyprus last month. Greece complained that the military alliance refused to prevent a conflict between the two NATO countries. There have been strong indications that Greece also may order the United States to close its seven military bases there. Dean Brelis reports from Athens tonight that a highly reliable Greek government source said this now will happen. The White House said it could not confirm the report. At the United Nations today, the Security Council unanimously appealed to Greece and Turkey to help the estimated 230,000 refugees driven from their homes by the war on Cyprus. The 15-member council also urged implementation of all steps leading to successful peace negotiations. Meanwhile, on Cyprus, a relative calm was broken today when gunmen tried to kill Vassos Lasaridis, the leader of the Cypriot Socialist Party. More on that from Bert Quint in Nicosia. The ambush took place near Lasaridis' office in downtown Nicosia. When he came along in this car, driven by a member of his party and accompanied by the driver's wife, the gunmen were waiting and let go with automatic weapons fire. The driver was fatally wounded, his wife slightly wounded. Lisarides, the target, escaped with cuts from flying glass. After resting for a while at the Greek embassy, the Greek Cypriot socialist told newsmen how and why he believed it happened. Given that the whole, whole conspiracy against Cyprus was, in my opinion, hatched by the CIA, I can hardly have any doubts that behind the assassination attempt against me was the American CIA and the people that are still governing here through the coup I mean, government court, not in the real sense, but anyhow, are more or less in position to do what they have done. While the atmosphere of despair thickened on the Greek side of the line dividing Greek and Turkish-held territories, there was joy and martial music in the area controlled by the Turks. It's not the easy victory over the Greeks on Cyprus that the Turks were celebrating, but a much tougher one, 52 years ago. Then it was the Greeks who were the invaders. It was after World War I. The Turks had fought on the German side. With Allied help, the Greeks moved on to the Turkish mainland. Then, on August 30th, the Turks won a battle that led to victory over their age-old enemies. This year's celebration, on an island where the Greeks long had dominated and often persecuted the Turkish minority, had special meaning for Turkish Cypriots. Ralph Dengtash, leader of the Turkish Cypriot community. Now it is more significant because the same army has given us our freedom. And as the speaker has just said, this has also given freedom, brought democracy to Greece, and has saved the Greek Cypriots from uh, the junta. Along with the pride of victory, you could sense the deep bitterness the present victors feel. One Turkish soldier put it this way, the Greeks have always been our enemies and they always will be. Bert Quint, CBS News, Nicosia. A powerful bomb apparently set by terrorists exploded in Tokyo today, wrecking the lobby of a 10-story office building and cutting down scores of people. Bruce Dunning reports. The bomb exploded at lunchtime in the heart of Tokyo's financial district. The blast shattered windows for blocks around and rained a torrent of broken glass onto the streets below. Seven people died instantly, but there were more than 200 injured, many seriously slashed by the flying glass. Police at first thought a propane gas tank had exploded, but they quickly found that a dynamite time bomb had been planted at the entrance to the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries building. A telephone operator in the building said that just before the blast, 
an anonymous caller had warned that explosives had been planted there, adding, this is no joke. There was not even time to warn people in the building before the blast occurred. Police also said a young man fled the area just after the explosion, and they believe he may have planted the bomb moments before it went off. Mitsubishi is one of Japan's financial and industrial giants. It is also the chief weapons supplier to the Japanese armed forces, a fact which has made it a target for radical anti-military groups in the past. Radical groups have denounced the firm for contributing to a revival of Japanese militarism. Although lately there has been little radical activity in Japan, police suspect the bombing was the work of one of the many radical and ultra-radical factions in Japan. Whatever the cause or the reason, the blast destroyed the image of Tokyo as a city free of the terrorism that is plaguing more and more of the world's great cities. Bruce Dunning, CBS News, Tokyo. The World Population Conference in Bucharest ended today with almost unanimous approval of a broad population control plan of the 149 nations attending the conference. The only delegation to oppose the plan was the Vatican. The plan asked for a reduction in world birth rates and for family planning information and services to be provided to all who want them. Who backs you best? Say something except for tires, just wears out on your new car during the first 12 months of 12,000 miles under normal use and service. Everyone covers the engine and drivetrain. What about plugs and points, shock absorbers, hoses and belts, light bulbs? Who aligns your wheels, tightens nuts and bolts, and has a plan for a free loan of car if guaranteed repairs take overnight? AMC Buyer Protection Plan. We back them better because we build them better. The beautiful thing about family toothpaste is that it's mild enough for kids. But if you have false teeth, maybe you need DentuCream, a powerful toothpaste especially made for false teeth. DentuCream is powerful enough to scrub dentures clean and fresh with special ingredients no family toothpaste has. DentuCream is for dentures. It isn't kid stuff. The Dow Jones Industrials rose almost 22 points on the New York Stock Exchange today, their biggest gain in more than three weeks. Brokers said the gain was a combination of bargain hunting and hoped that the tight money policy might soon be eased. Volume was 16,200,000 shares, the average price per share, gained 70 cents on the New York Exchange, 15 cents on the American. Attorney General Saxby said today that state lotteries may violate federal gaming laws, and he has invited the governors of 13 states which have lotteries to meet with him about it next week. More from Fred Graham. Attorney General Saxby took aim today at a legal problem that had its beginnings a century ago when a few states created lotteries that cheated the public and Congress passed laws and shut them down. But those federal laws remained on the books almost forgotten until about 10 years ago when financially burdened states began again to create lotteries. Those lotteries were run honestly, but most or all of them appeared to violate those old federal laws, particularly ones against sending lottery tickets through the mails or advertising in media that cross state lines. In recent months, the Justice Department has tried without success to get Congress to repeal those laws. So today, Saxby said he would act unless the states can persuade Congress to. We think that uh if uh, they are going to be in the lottery business, they should go to Congress and uh, ask for change in some of these laws. So what you'll do first, as I understand it, is bring civil suits uh, to determine if there is I illegality. And to shut them down if it is. That's correct. Saxby said he could be ready to file those suits in about six weeks. So to save the day, those 13 states must persuade a majority of the members of Congress to cast votes in favor of legalized gambling. And nobody could say today if such a majority could be found. Fred Graham, CBS News, at the Justice Department. The lottery has been a fast-spreading phenomenon in recent years. The state sought new sources of revenue, and it has proved to be a bonanza of the 13 states now operating lotteries. Most use the money for education. And in New York, for example, with the winner's jackpot ranging up to a million dollars, the state lottery has cleared $274 million in seven years. From Chicago, Sharon Lovejoy reports on the newest of the state lotteries. In Illinois, buyers first started shelling out for the lottery tickets July 30th.
Before the week was out, a record 7,250,000 were sold, and the state had a net profit of almost one and a half million dollars. The idea behind the lottery is simple. Tickets made up by the state are distributed to banks, which in turn distribute them to state licensed agents. The agent sells to the public, then returns the unsold tickets to the bank, along with the money collected, minus his commission. The money is then credited to the state and earmarked mostly for education. Attorney General Saxby's argument holds that, by law, banks may not act as distributors or handle any lottery funds. Spokesmen for the First National Bank, which is the state depository, claim they are not acting illegally. They say they are merely handling deposits made by one of their many clients, namely the state of Illinois. Questions about the legality of the lottery have been plentiful from the beginning. Now, with Saxby's challenge, it looks as though would-be winners may miss out on their bonanza unless the issue is settled soon in Washington. Sharon Lovejoy, CBS News, Chicago. Mom, thought your arthritis was acting up. My shoulder's not so stiff this morning. Took two of these to relieve the pain before I went to bed. Relieves minor arthritic pain and stiffness for hours. Bayer timed release aspirin. Sounds different. It is. The other leading products are made to be taken every four hours. Bayer timed release once in eight hours. The difference is micro encapsulated aspirin. Helps me wake without that morning stiffness. This relief really lasts. Bayer timed release aspirin. It's made to work overtime. For people who have to cram a day and a half's work into one working day, whose reward for that is sometimes acid indigestion and heartburn, we made Philips tablets. We made Philips tablets 25% stronger than the leading roll type antacid, and we made them to work fast. So fast they start doing their job in seconds. Philips tablets, with the strength and speed you need. They work as hard as I do. George Steinbrenner and the American Shipbuilding Company, which he heads, were fined a total of $35,000 today for campaign financing violations. They had pleaded guilty of contributing corporate funds to various political candidates, Republicans and Democrats, and Richard Nixon among them. The fines were the maximum allowed by law and the heaviest by far of the dozen or so cases handled to date. Steinbrenner's guilty plea also involved charges of trying to influence employees to cover up the illegal contributions. He could have gotten six years in prison, but no prison sentence was imposed. In Georgia today, William Williams drew a 40-year prison sentence for the kidnapping last February of Atlanta Constitution editor Reg Murphy, who was held 49 hours but was not harmed. After the sentencing, William's wife Betty also pleaded guilty and drew a three-year suspended sentence. A federal judge took an unusual step today to help the Consumer Product Safety Commission call attention to what the commission sees as dangers in using a certain household work light. Neil Strausser has that story. It was, said Commission Chairman Richard Simpson, a very unusual circumstance. Judge George Hart had ordered him to hold a news conference and had personally called the networks inviting them to attend. In a final effort to get out through voluntary news coverage, the message about the alleged shock hazard caused by a too soft plastic handle on one unlabeled make of light. Simpson had wanted a precedent-setting court order requiring the manufacturer and dealers to buy warning advertisements. But Judge Hart felt collecting the money for the ads would take too long. So the cameras rolled as Simpson demonstrated. The distinguishing feature of this, and in fact the same thing that caused it to provide this source of electricity and be hazard, is the extremely soft, fle flexible handle. This one up here. Most of these trouble lights are quite rigid. They're molded. Near the top is, uh, is a place where you plug this in, and then you can plug a tool in here. It's an outlet. When you touch this, and I'm going to just, I, I'm leaning my hand against it, and a normal way to pick it up is like this. Here's how you get the source of electricity. This is part of the receptacle connections, it's, and it's tied, electrically tied to the ends of this plug. That's the source of electricity. If this were plugged in and I were to touch that and were to be grounded, that's the shock situation. Simpson says the trouble lights may have caused one death and that over 170,000 of them may still be in the hands of endangered consumers. Neil Strausser, CBS News, Washington. Incidentally, commission officials advise persons who own the lights to return them to the place of purchase or contact the commission itself for more information. Eric Severide comments tonight on President Ford's graduation speech at Ohio State University. 
An American president made a speech to American college students today and was not subjected to booze, heckling, or perishable farm produce. Mr. Ford began his speech in Columbus with a couple of jokes. Again, they were good jokes when they came out of his speechwriter's typewriter, but they lost both body and bouquet when they came out of his mouth. Presidents seem to have as hard a time with humor as they do with inflation. Mr. Johnson's stories were uproarious in private, though he did like to repeat the punchline a couple of times for more laughs, but not in public. Mr. Nixon had wit but no humor. Ford seems to have humor but no wit. And that's safer for the country than the other way around. Next to power without honor, the most dangerous thing in the world is power without humor. All this is a digression from the president's speech, but it was one of those speeches that mandate digression. He told the students what they had no trouble agreeing with, that they are the future, that they ought to have the kinds of jobs they have trained for, jobs that make both sense and money, as he put it. He thinks the federal government should help match graduate skills with jobs that require those skills, and this will be one of the neater tricks of the week or the generation. To really do that, you would have to control the number of students allowed to study for the various professions. What we have now is a boom and bust or lemmings rushing into the sea phenomena. A few years ago, untold thousands studied to be teachers. The building and expansion of schools and colleges suddenly slacked off because of the population age profile, among other reasons, and they could not get jobs. We've had a doctor shortage, or at least a serious imbalance in their distribution. So extra thousands have been going into the medical schools. A glut of doctors is at least possible. Lawyers suddenly seem to have great power as well as bank accounts, and law schools are now besieged. This last year, journalism has been in, all because of a couple of enterprising young men on the Washington Post digging into Watergate. So an enormous number of youngsters dreaming dreams of glory are besieging the journalism schools. Unless the whole population agrees to get sick, be sued, and double its purchases of papers and magazines, there's trouble ahead. President Ford also wants colleges to open their doors to ordinary workers, not only as students, but as teachers. It sounds sensible, especially the last part. San Francisco street cleaners about to earn 17,000 a year, welders on the new atomic power plants making uh, 40 to 60,000 obviously possess a higher wisdom that any PhD could profit from. Earlier in our broadcast, we quoted an Associated Press report that President Ford expects to campaign this fall for both Republicans and Democrats who back his fiscal restraint policy. The AP now says that Mr. Ford is not planning to campaign for those Democrats, but would favor their election. The State Department said today it will turn over quickly American Army deserter Ronald Anderson to Canadian authorities. The 31-year-old Anderson, who has received landed immigrant status in Canada, was arrested by U.S. Customs agents last Saturday after visiting his family in the state of Washington. He was apprehended on Canadian soil near the border just south of Vancouver, British Columbia. Canada immediately requested Anderson's release. The State Department spokesman said the details of the release from Fort Lewis, Washington are being worked on. 22-year-old Army 2nd Lieutenant Mary Lou Follett and 21-year-old Private First Class James Johnson have decided to leave the Army. The couple met while stationed in West Germany, and they got a lot of publicity when it was learned that they were living together, and Army officials said that violated rules about fraternizing between officers and enlisted men. Lieutenant Follett said the last straw was when the Army refused to promote her. So she's resigning, and Private Johnson is quitting when his hitch is up next month. Admiral Hyman Rickover, the developer of the nuclear submarine and an officer well-known for his outspoken views, said today in a Seattle speech that the U.S. Navy has become a pompous bureaucracy filled with waste and technical incompetence. Rickover said there has been no period in the past 50 years when the fleet has been in as poor a condition as it is in today. Rickover said there are too many admirals in the Pentagon, and he said the ones who are there don't have the technical training that they need. Batmobile needs waxing. I'll use this easy no buffing wax. Old chum, a rally car wax is just as easy, but does more. More? Observe, rally is made to clean, to remove dirty road film. Your wax isn't. Great grime. I would have waxed right over dirt. Precisely. DuPont Rally waxes the car, not the dirt. Recognize buckwheat? This hardy grain helped feed a growing nation. Now it's scarce. This is buckwheat, stone ground. And you can still get it right here in buckwheat cereal. 
flakes with a snap of maple flavor. High nutrition, of course. But the taste goes way back. Think of old-time buckwheat cakes and maple syrup. That's what prompted buckwheat's flavor. One of the true old-fashioned flavors left to enjoy. Jimmy Connors, the top-seeded male tennis player at the U.S. Open in Forest Hills, won his first match today. Both Connors and his opponent, Jeff Boroviak, had their troubles with Mother Nature, though. Afternoon rains made the grass courts slippery at times. To some, those grass courts are of greater concern than the tennis itself. Bob McNamara has that story. For more than a week, the best players in the game compete in the U.S. Open. Thousands will come here to watch the biggest names and applaud the backhands, serves, and lob shots that have made some players famous. This man, however, is here to watch their feet. He's 63-year-old Owen Sheridan, the groundskeeper at Forest Hills. A native of Northern Ireland, his face has been leathered by 42 summers of hot sun here, and he gets very upset at times because that's his ground. They're tearing and digging and scuffing. I don't like the people who drag their toe on the cell and drag their foot when they run in, you know? To me, uh, I'm more, more interested in the court than I am in the tennis. And then you get some people who drag their toe on the cell, especially when the ground is soft, you're gonna have a cavity. Does that make you angry when you see that? Oh, I sure it does. <laughs> I mean, what are you gonna do with it? I mean, it takes sod about six weeks to grow one by right, and you can't go out and just stick a sod in there because if you saw it then, you should pull the sod out. Just after sunup, the day starts for Sheridan and his ground crew. Normally, he has seven men to help him, but during the U.S. Open, his staff grows to 30. Every day, they must mow the courts, the grass to be no taller than three-eighths of an inch. A roller that weighs a ton keeps the court as firm and strong as outdoor carpeting. Every morning, the courts are lined. The stripes must be accurate, for fractions of an inch can decide the winner or loser of thousands of dollars. Keeping 23 lawn tennis courts in playing shape and healthy is almost a science. Owen Sheridan has found it's also a thankless job. The compliments are outnumbered by the complaints. Well, the complaint about the court being bad bounces and all that, you know, and not being hard enough. And always, you know, well, these fellas run a lot of attention, and uh, now there's big money in it, and uh, bad bounce can mean a lot to somebody, you know. After more than four decades of being around Forest Hills, one might think that Owen Sheridan could appreciate the finer points of tennis. But quite frankly, he's bored by the game. You're not particularly interested in tennis, are you? No, I have saw so much tennis in my life that, I, you know, it's like anything else. When you see too much of it, uh, you get fed up with it. And I wouldn't actually go out of my way to see a tennis match, you know. This is the last year there will be grass courts in the stadium at Forest Hills. Nine of the 23 grass courts will be converted to a composite playing surface, courts of finely crushed rock. Will Owen Sheridan miss grass tournaments after 42 years? Not at all, he says. It's too much work, too much to worry about. A lot like babysitting for a spoiled brat. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Forest Hills. That's the news. I'm Bob Schieffer, CBS News, New York. Talk about house paint is cheap, but spread gel flow has something to show. This is what gel flow oil-based house paint does. This is our top competitor. See the difference? The way gel flow acts in my hand is how gel flow loads on your brush. Loads on heavier, but glides on smoother and hides in one coat, even over black. Just follow label directions. Only gel flow is this thick, so it paints this smoothly. Get to know Glidden spread gel flow. It does what it says. Now there's Fixident, a plastic cream discovery that has revolutionized denture holding to help keep dentures tight when you bite. Fixident flows evenly, smoothly, filling gaps and forming a strong, resilient seal in your mouth that even stands up to pressure when you bite hard. Feel more secure, more comfortable with Fixident. It helps keep dentures tight when you bite. Fixident. From CBS News headquarters in New York, this has been the CBS Evening News with Bob Schieffer substituting for Walter Cronkite. This is CBS.